just now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what a wonderful occasion. Thank you all for coming. And apparently now we get to do this more in the future. So we get to meet in person. There's nothing more magical and dynamic we've learned, right? Because of the absence thereof, of being able to meet in person and to enjoy one another and to um, learn from each other here at the Institute of World Culture as Santa Barbara citizens and also as uh, citizens of the world, really. Which is another thing that we learned in the, in the pandemic, how interdependent we are. So here we are. We are at the, uh, this will be the founding day address uh, that is delivered every year on time. Um, either on the computer or in person or however we, we can do it. And Dr. Carolyn Dorrance will be uh, presenting today on symbol, aims and symbols of uh, global leadership. And she'll be using uh, Theodore Roosevelt as exhibit A, as I understand it. No, C. C, okay. <laughs> and Barack Obama, is he exhibit? He's D. He's D, okay, all right, great. So, um, the Institute of World Culture was started um, in 1976, and there are wonderful stories of the completion of this building and of uh, all the construction and so forth that went into it. It has, uh, re the building has received awards through the years for being like a monument and part of the fundamentals of, of the beauty and the meaning of Santa Barbara. And it was conceived and designed um, by a galaxy of really remarkable people. And my understanding is that they came up with the aims of the Institute, the 10 aims, by meeting every Friday night for at least six months. And they brainstormed these ideas and uh, really tried to distill what would be the vision and the guidelines and the direction of the Institute of World Culture here. So um, I think we would like to um, hear those aims uh, read out aloud by Carl Nolt at this point. The Institute of World Culture inaugurated on the 4th of July, 1976. The Declaration of Interdependence. One, to explore the classical and Renaissance traditions of East and West and their continuing relevance to emerging modes and patterns of living. Two, to renew the universal vision behind the American dream through authentic affirmations of freedom, excellence, and self-transcendence in an ever-evolving republic of conscience. Three, to honor through appropriate observance the contributions of men and women of all ages world culture, or to enhance the enjoyment of the creative artistry and craftsmanship of all cultures. Five, to deepen awareness of the universality of man's spiritual striving and its rich variety of expression in the religions, philosophies, and literatures of humanity. Six, Promote forums for fearless inquiry and constructive dialogue concerning the frontiers of science, the therapeutics of self-transformation, and the societies of the future. Seven, to investigate the imaginative use of the spiritual, mental, and material resources of the globe in the service of universal welfare. Eight, 
to examine the changing social structures in terms of the principle that a world culture is greater than the sum of its parts and to envision the conditions, prospects, and possibilities of the world civilization of the future. Nine, to assist in the emergence of men and women of universal culture, capable of continuous growth and nonviolence of mind, generosity of heart, and harmony of soul. Ten, to promote universal brotherhood and to foster human fellowship among all races, nations, and cultures. Thank you, Carl, so much. As you all know, Carl was one of the founding members of the Institute here, and it's very appropriate that we would hear from Carl today about those aims. And as you can see, the aims are um, expansive and far-reaching, like a launch pad for the future, but they're also very uh, transformative and have to do with the cultivation of, of human beings. And that's what it seems that the Institute is all about. And now we have all these different venues, I guess you could say thanks to COVID, really, uh, for conducting meetings. So um, even though it's wonderful that we can meet together again, obviously, but also um, that we're going to be really utilizing the, inst the uh, internet now with continued Zoom meetings, et cetera, and also with webcasts. So for example, today is gonna to be our first webcast and we're still working out some of the bugs of the technology here, but we're coming along. And um, But the exciting thing is that the in-person and the electronic methods, it looks like are now gonna be working together. For example, you guys are part of our first live studio audience <laughs> to, uh, to, as we uh, broadcast this to uh, YouTube on a live uh, webcast. So uh, very exciting things, and also just the diversity and the flexibility of what we'll be able to uh, have to offer here. So um, there has been some very hard work by people who have put together uh, the new studio. Um, and Carolyn, well, let's hear a shout out for them. For, this is really Carolyn, yes, yes. And uh, Carolyn uh, has conveyed to me the, just the sheer gratitude, and she will talk more about that. Um, so speaking of Carolyn here, here's our star. Dr. Carolyn Dorrance, um, she said, if there isn't much time, you can, you can abbreviate it, but no, I want to read every word here. <laughs> So uh, Carolyn Dor Dr. Carolyn Dorrance is a native of Massachusetts, so, and she grew up surrounded by stories, as you would expect in Massachusetts, of history and politics that were available in the, all the excellent public libraries. And she was educated at Mount Holyoke College, where she earned her BA. From Columbia University, no less, she received and earned her MA and then here at UCSB, she earned her PhD. And she has taught everything, political philosophy, American studies, um, these specifically at the College of William and Mary in, the, in Williamsburg, Virginia. So this is part of the foundations, right, that she comes from. And she has taught history over the last 39, 40 years. Um, at uh, Oxnard College, and she has taught what? She has taught women's history, philosophy, including comparative religion and political science, and she has taught international relations and constitutional law for the last 40 years, as we said. Now, she became a founding member of the Institute of World Culture in 1976, and is currently serving as, as president. She has offered many talks and seminars over the years. Recent ones were on the suffrage movement and the use of protest, very timely. 
She laments the sad state of global leadership by governments, but hopes that this talk will call attention to many inspiring, creative, and courageous acts of global leadership by citizens of the world. Dr. Carolyn Dorrance. Yes, I just wanted to extend my gratitude to the workers who created this gem, and there's a podcast room in there. Uh, Russ Lewin, um, Robert Moore, Kirk Gardeen, Carl Rutnold, um, and certainly the workers Jonathan provided during the meltdown um, of his acacia workers, they did, they did all the really tough work, <laughs> which is tougher, physical labor or technological innovation. I guess we know the, the real answer to that. So we are very grateful and very excited about the possible uh, uses of this new technology, uh, really. Uh, and so welcome to those who might be on YouTube. Uh, you fortunately will be able to see all the photos and the idea that you can speak to the whole world at once um, is uh, a little daunting. Our topic, uh, the aims and symbols of global leadership um, seems apt. Uh, in a recent interview, uh, a prolific author, Andy Slavik, um, was being quizzed about his uh, new book that mapped out why the United States failed so miserably in meeting the pandemic. And at the end, he was um, kind of asked for a summary. So what would you say was really the main problem? And his answer was lack of leadership. And that uh, struck a bell with me because it seems for the last four years at least, I've been very concerned by what I felt was the lack of leadership around the world, particularly by government leaders. And uh, even faithful Europe seemed to have um, dissolved in its um, uh, leadership activity. And we all know that in various uh, ways, whether it's the family or the school or local government, um, wherever we look, um, here and abroad, we've seen a lot of failure of leadership. So um, now that that's been experienced in painful ways, maybe we're seeing the signs, particularly by a new generation, of assuming leadership. So I hope this uh, talk um, inspires you and uh, suggests that you're not going to be, um, uh, you're not going to be, uh, you need not be so negative about leadership. And so let's just look at a few characteristics of leadership that um, I thought of a few years ago when I was writing an essay. The first thing to remember that leadership ex is everywhere. It's in many different contexts, family, community, churches, education, sports teams, governments, um, NGOs, global institutions. So um, it's, it's, uh, there's many, positively, we can find leadership um, in many, um, in many uh, situations that um, are not under government control. You can distinguish between leadership that is a fulfillment of objective roles, whether they develop by traditions or institutionally, like here we keep saying, well, the Constitution's the framework, or they're legally defined. Or we can see that leadership might be shown through subjective characteristics of a particular individual. Uh, things like clarity of mind and speech, a desire to serve, honesty, courage, sacrifice, empathy, charisma, um, you can add to this list um, and send me an email if you'd like. Um, the second um, uh, focus is to ask about the aims and duties of leadership. And we think that leaders have insights, the people who become leaders have insights 
into the needs of others, maybe even what we would call a vision. Uh, they're committed to serving the welfare of others. Uh, they must identify and promote the common good, improve conditions, bring about change. Leaders provide survival, psychological calm. They reinforce the identity, both of individuals and groups, and they might apply ideology as a way of educate, educating and attractive um, those who might be led by them. And they must offer some path to a meaningful life. And we think that's more important than you might think <clears throat> because we think that's um, one of the factors that's affecting so much disturbance in this country. Um, people grow up, they get out of high school, and after 10 years or so, they've not found some path to a meaningful life. And so frustration grows. And unfortunately, they uh, tend to um, blame others for their, their situation or their boredom. Okay. So I'm sorry this isn't up on the screen for you to look at. And I'll maybe, if I'm talking too quickly, let me know. A leader has listening and communication skills, and we could talk about this for an hour, but we usually remember the fireside chats of FDR um, using the new technology of radio. Uh, press briefings, um, uh, President Biden is going out almost every day to uh, give a briefing uh, for 15, 20 minutes on whatever pressing issue there is. And the press loves this, whereas President uh, Trump uh, barely had any press conferences and few direct briefings for whatever reason. Uh, they can also provide images of service like going down to the border like, or to the, uh, the, the, rugged, um, the building that collapsed and um, talk especially with the um, and talks especially with the, um, um, the survivors, the family members, and we're, we're very used to that now, that the president should go down to the most concrete level of where something is happening and needs to be uh, responded to. A leader, now uh, remember these are not ideals, they're necessities. And if you look a little closely, you can see that leaders that we're going to be speaking of do um, try to educate their, um, their, their listeners. A leader must seek truth in a way that is factual and principled. He or she articulates goals that inspire but are relevant in practice. He or she recognizes facts by listening to others, like experts, but also um, those who have gone through some uh, direct experience or just have some good idea. A leader encourages others to become seekers of truth. Uh, your, his efforts or sure her efforts will be much more effective if other people understand what uh, he's trying to aim for, what he's trying, trying to um, bring about a change by. And so then you have a few and then you have many more who want to understand the situation in a factual and uh, relevant way. A leader is thoughtful but must be flexible and adaptive, respond to the unexpected. And we can see examples of that. And finally, a leader must, um, uh, is a teacher who educates others intellectually, moral, socially. Uh, a leader unlocks human potential, and that's very important, uh, so that the listeners can find, or watchers can find, uh, that there's something in themselves that they hadn't uh, thought about or understood. He or she empowers, other, empowers others to support, help, participate in common needs. 
he or she mobilizes cooperation and understands that political education is not to be seen as boring or irrelevant, but is needed for civic responsibility. And uh, that is one of the um, challenges of this whole voting rights uh, situation. And in the uh, last election, some, uh, the woman from Georgia, Stacey Abraham, uh, who had run for governor and been defeated, um, she stayed in there and she organized, I think she said that she um, increased the registration by 800,000 people and thus, you know, turned out uh, an active, uh, they can, she convinced them that it was their responsibility to vote and they shouldn't be complaining if they're not getting their share of public welfare. And at this point, um, so that's some general characteristics of leadership, which you want to keep in mind. And we do see that um, leaders do that. Uh, Martin Luther King would take time to explain why they were doing something. Uh, they had a training <coughs> camp up in Tennessee that they would send people like Rosa Parks to, to learn and understand um, what the uh, practice of nonviolence uh, entailed and how to respond to difficult situations. But our focus today is on global leadership. And so, yeah, have you thought of that? Could you name an example of that? Um, we have a kind of um, ideological um, uh, bias towards this word. We think that a global leader is a world traveler uh, someone who's known, well-known globally, travels around to various um, places, uh, is recognizable to some extent, relatively speaking, because you always discover pockets of complete ignorance of even very famous people. A leader speaks to and influences a variety of people in different lands and cultures. Uh, he or she sends messages in response to emergencies. So you hear, well, the Dalai Lama has just sent a letter to the president um, you know, commiserating in some way. And um, a leader is very, um, is very sensitive to uh, the suffering that might be involved in some situation. Um, a leader, we think, has written books that are translated and distributed around the world. Uh, he now may speak on the internet even have his own website or studio. And what he produces is available on DVDs and public libraries. I don't know if they still have them, but I borrowed several um, DVDs from the Santa Barbara Library that were speeches the Dalai Lama had made. And that, um, uh, that, that was very instructive and it was very free. Um, a leader globally speaks to leaders around the world. He may visit with them. He may just have a phone call with them. Um, so that's what we expect um, a leader to be. Um, and I chose, when I thought about it, well, do we have any um, world leaders that kind of fit that profile? And I came up, um, wasn't too long, with a Dalai Lama. And unfortunately, you can't see the photos that we have. You might want to go on YouTube after you get home or have nothing else to do um, and see the talk with the photos. Um, that will make things uh, perhaps more clear. And so um, we have a photo here of him teaching. Uh, after he was a refugee from uh, Tibet, he took refuge in Dharamsala. The Indian government was very, um, very hospitable. And he thought evidently that maybe there's a way that um, he can get back to Tibet and the Chinese would not uh, overstay their non-welcome. And he had those though after uh, 10 years um, who wanted to encourage him to think broad, more broadly. One of them was Professor Raghavan Iyer, who um, is a co-founder of the Institute. 
He took a trip in 1963 to Dharamsala to have a conversation with uh, the Dalai Lama, who then was in his mid-20s, and encouraged him to think globally that maybe his dharma, maybe his opportunity was to bring his ideas about peace and nonviolence. He was uh, completely um, educated in Buddhism while he was growing up, um, and he is a committed Buddhist. And so that Buddhism has a, a lot of very shareable ideas. So Professor Raghavan evidently encouraged him to think more largely uh, of his possible mission now that he was uh, disrupted from his uh, traditional role in Tibet. And one of the first, um, one of the first, uh, first um, examples of this is he was taken to London and it was announced he was going to give a talk and there was a particular effort to um, attract the various uh, monks, Buddhist monks from monasteries in Britain and Europe. And they all came together, um, all in their robes and all, and he, he instructed them. But it was at a very high level of um, almost esoteric concepts in Buddhism. But they hadn't had anybody to teach and explain those ideas. So I did see a photo. I couldn't find it uh, singular. But um, that of him teaching in this auditorium in London these monks um, how to understand different basic terms. Um, he began to broaden his audience. And by his 80th birthday celebration, um, there were a lot of protocols when you were near the Dalai Lama. And we experienced them when he came to Santa Barbara. Uh, one of his visits, um, a lot of people in this room you know, were we were the ushers and the um, order keepers, which wasn't a problem. But um, there were a lot of protocols. You bowed. You never let your head be higher than his. Um, you kept your distance. You didn't go up and hug him. Um, so that was the beginning. Um, I think the first trip was in about 1980. And by the time, 20 years later, on his 80th birthday, down, being celebrated down at River University at Riverside, uh, you had photos of him sitting at round tables with students and um, drinking uh, a soft drink and um, reaching over into whatever was in the center of the table like everybody else. So he'd come to, in a sense, to make himself available at a, vo a very um, open level. And we... Uh, but he still maintains his uh, center in Dharamsala. If you go to DalaiLama.com, you can see when the next time he's going to speak. And on some occasions, he speaks uh, reading religious texts or sutras. And on others, he has. And so how many world leaders um, um, are set up uh, with various machines over there on the side? but set up in their colorful workroom. And if you get more normally now, he sits and has two big TV screens filled with the pictures of various people who've been invited. Maybe it's students from Indonesia. Maybe it's Buddhists from Europe. Um, and so he can see a segment of those who are interested in his teaching. And he teaches a, teaches a very basic a doctrine of what we need to work on, like education uh, should include, he says, um, room for emotional uh, development and uh, how to guard against negative emotions. He thinks that's one of our worst problems. Um, so try it out if you um, uh, have TV and, um, I, well, no, you usually have to use the computer, excuse me. I, I look at a monitor and I kind of think TV still. But um, you can go on and you find a schedule over on the side of future events. Uh, he usually gives an address at least uh, and a Q&A at least once a month. 
and you can also listen to past uh, uh, talks that he's given. So he's now made himself available to thousands, if not millions, uh, by his openness. So he certainly fits the profile of a global leader. Uh, I think we would agree. Uh, then the next photo is have him speaking to, uh, I'd say there's about 2,000 people, including a whole number of monks, but also lay people. Um, so he's been all around the world and he has spoken to thousands. I think he's come five times to Santa Barbara. The last time was to connect, uh, commemorate the anniversary of the new Tibetan study center there. Um, I know I went. They had to have two, uh, one, one meeting on Friday um, and then another, well, another in the afternoon. I think they had a third on Saturday. So you had to get tickets, um, but um, it was worth seeing and hearing and listening to him, um, we thought. So he did what he could to be a world leader available to many. Another, um, or what has made the Dalai Lama into a world leader? His spiritual influence and experience, his faithfulness to Buddhism, but tolerant of other religions, and his book, The Kinship of Faith, says much about that, his moral and intellectual knowledge and commitment, the universality of his message. He offers practical advice, such as for education of young people, he meets with heads of state, including the Pope, and has a de debate about whether or not there exists a personal God. And he's, he's able to tell the Pope that, no, he does not believe in that kind of God. So I'm not sure how many people who visit the Pope will say that to him. He speaks truth to power. He gives speeches at the United Nations, and yet he'll greet ordinary folks when he goes around the streets of Japan. He has institutional status, a role within his Buddhist uh, community, um, but he's really a citizen of the world. He speaks out in response to special events. He recognizes suffering when it's happening, and that's, of course, one of the first uh, noble truths of Buddhist teaching. His workroom shows traditional colors and sacred objects, but high-tech um, machines uh, have been, uh, I think that's, uh, no, I didn't want that. Oh, I press that. No. So uh, there's so much you can be said about him, obviously. Uh, another global leader we determined was Mohandas Gandhi. He, what he did and his influence is parallel to what the, uh, what the Dalai Lama did, but with a difference. Um, Gandhi was, um, lived and uh, on three continents, um, England, um, you're so Europe, uh, Africa, South Africa, um, and then went back to his native land of India. But after that, he did not travel very much until, um, about 25 years after he went back, he went to England. Um, and his focus seemingly was on the gaining of independence of India by challenging colonialism in words and deeds, which was a shared global problem at the time, but Gandhi just stayed focused on India. So is he a world leader? Well, and he had three aims. He wanted to uh, expose colonialism and systems of exploitation as morally wrong. Secondly, he insisted that nonviolence is necessary for leadership and that civil disobedience is okay if it comes with a mental and moral discipline and uh, an understanding that it takes courage and sacrifice to stand there and be beaten, as you saw in the movie, outside a factory that you're protesting its methods of um, uh, employment. And thirdly, he had the insight that any movement for political and social change much, must reach out to the poor, the socially excluded, 
the rural people, the disadvantaged. And it was very controversial when, he, after uh, about three, I said four or five years of being part of the Congress Party movement in India, he insisted on going out to the country and educating the people in the villages to the need to uh, protest and stand against the colonial authority of the British. It was seen by the elite leaders in the Congress party as a waste of time. You can't teach these people anything and they don't have anything to really, that really counts. But Gandhi thought their understanding, their engagement, their participation was essential. And that has proved to be very much uh, the truth. You've got to in any kind of national or larger um, community uh, effort for freedom or independence. You need all the people in the society, not just um, a small educated elite. These three aims gained lasting global in influence long after his death. So Gandhi became a world leader by the uh, continuity the, and expansion of these three um, principles he uh, took as uh, essential to the battle for uh, independence in India. And so he created, uh, he did things that created a, um, created a legacy, you might say. And so why can, uh, can't he be regarded as a world leader even if he didn't leave India um, um, but once? So he established political democracy as a necessary duty of leadership. You had to reach out. He used creative methods like civil disobedience with nonviolence, <coughs> disturb the situation. Well, that's not very nice. Well, no, disturb the situation. Um, his efforts at self-examination and use of spiritual texts is recorded in 90 volumes, which you used to be, I guess you still can be found in the uh, UCSB library. And that points to a, a very significant um, aim that he had. To be a leader, you must transform yourself. You must take on a discipline. You must wake up um, both the, um, the good values and the demons in, within you and do something about them. So you, you in a sense, you purify, pur, purify yourself uh, using, in his case, spiritual texts like the Bhagavad Gita. And in that way, you become stronger and your influence over others will um, become stronger. So leadership must embody the values and ideals one teaches, not just talk about. So his leadership went global, and we saw that last summer when the protesters went global. And there was a replication of Gandhian ideas. The participants constantly stressed that the protests were to be nonviolent. And they did this when there was a, a, a faction that was breaking windows and stealing and all of that. He said, that's not us. That's not us. And as the protests spread, that expression of nonviolence as a defining principle of the protest spread with it. And so certainly um, one, if a, one as a pessimist would never expect to see so many people in so many different countries all over the world expressing the principle of nonviolence. Gandhi predicted that his ideas would be forgotten for 30 years or so, uh, but a younger time would come when a younger generation would revive them. Then there would be many Gandhis. That was his prediction. And his ideas are taught in school curriculums, and they're practiced in the civil rights marches um, led by Martin Luther King Jr. and in many other ways. Name the ideas, name the um, grievance that people have and legitimate grievances. Uh, so you have to follow his, and his advice about 
defining carefully what the issue is, uh, talking it over, and then, but also um, listening to the leader who has a, um, a creative idea. And that this, in this way, you can bring about change and actually bring down uh, tyrannical sources of power. So with global leadership may require a long timeline. And we probably haven't seen the end of Gandhi's influence. Uh, here's a photo of him leading people on a march. Um, so I wish you could see it. And another photo of him leading uh, just th hundreds of people behind him, all happily going with him on this march. Uh, one of them is the Salt March, in which he um, walked uh, for um, a very long time to a site in the south that had, um, was on a beach. And when they got there, then they started plunging into the ocean and um, picking up sand that could be worked with and salt could be precipitated from it. And they were busily doing that when the police arrived and began to subject them to awful beatings. But uh, people took it. And it was, um, it was very much um, a fulfillment of his aim and his argument that ordinary people, even people who are below the line of what we would call ordinary because they're so poor, disadvantaged, they took it. And they became obvious that they were an essential source of strength in this um, battle to become independent. Now, there's other kinds of global leadership um, within an institution. And you, can, you could identify several institutions, but the, um, the big one is the United Nations, uh, that, which was founded in 1945. And it was a team of people um, pushed, um, motivated and pushed by Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who after writing this Atlantic Charger, excuse me, Charter uh, with Winston Churchill while on a, um, a ship off seas, uh, had, had kind of defined, well, what are the goals? What are the goals of our side? Um, we certainly don't want fascism as Italy and uh, Germany and um, Japan were representing. So that really influenced FDR, and so he should get credit for pushing that idea into the Department of State and then identifying people within that Department of State to actually kind of really brainstorm this idea. An idea, incidentally, that uh, Theodore Roosevelt had put forth in a speech in um, 1918. No, excuse me, he put it forth in 1910 uh, when he was making his thank you speech for winning the, um, the Nobel Peace Prize. More on that later. He said that um, he rec Roosevelt recognized uh, that it was very needed to have a global institution to prevent more war to provide an institutional means to diplomatically establish peace. And there was the innovation soon um, of peacekeepers who would wear the blue hat uh, when they first went into the borders of the new state of Israel. And now, uh, I haven't checked the figure now, but the last time I did, uh, UN peacekeepers are in 138 countries including Costa Rica. And one wonders, I, I bet they're not there now, but one wonders why would you need peacekeepers in Costa Rica when um, it's common to see them as one of the peaceful uh, Central American <coughs> uh, countries. It has um, created a number of committees with tremendous research and service to help particularly um, businesses. If you wanted, you had a small business and you wanted to start having a facility in another country or trade or at least export to another country, um, you can go, 
go online and get all the instructions you need and all the forms to fill out. Uh, and you can call up um, or email one of their agencies, and people aren't aware of that. Uh, Ralph Bunch, whom we talked about a few years ago here, uh, he was um, um, an African-American. He was very well educated and very service oriented. He was one of the key um, participants in this founding period between 1942 and 1945. And you have um, the, a picture of the signing um, in San Francisco, October 25th, 1945. That was the, uh, the second of two conferences. The one in June was to kind of negotiate and talk about, and it was a real happening. Um, ordinary people, Hollywood people, came up to be seen walking through the lobby of the hotel where the uh, meeting was taking place. And so there was a lot of enthusiasm for this new uh, institution and a lot of hope of promise. Um, it has obviously had to survive through the Cold War and that uh, tension that has led to so many vetoes. Um, one of the, uh-oh, it's not going, Robert. It got stuck. I don't know why. See, it gives me a little thing like this. Um, one of the contributors to the founding was Eleanor Roosevelt, and she um, pushed and pushed for a universal declaration of human rights. And going over on the boat with the all-male, um, the rest of the delegation of all men, they were saying, oh, no, we can't get into that. It's kind of controversial. we got to make sure we get uh, this uh, established to prevent war and facilitate bur um, um, facilitate business and prevent the takeover, the destruction of capitalism. And she persisted, and she actually made um, friends with the Russian delegation. And uh, behind that had the support of Joseph Stalin. Now, who, who could expect <laughs> this woman <laughs> from um, an aristocratic background to just get along fine with Stalin. And he supported the United Nations, and he supported her Declaration of Universal um, Rights, which is quite long, actually. The issue was whether it was going to get into doing things like influencing worker conditions, um, support labor unions, or bring socialism um, around the world. And she assured him, she explained it. So she um, was a remarkable leader at that time, and she had been a leader in many other ways during the Depression. Uh, there's a picture here of her holding up the newspaper where the headline is the Declaration of Human Rights. So we certainly want to put her on the list. Um, there's a picture of her shaping ha shaking hands with a very important leader um, in the FDR and in the World War II um, activities. Um, I'm gonna say George Marshall, but it's not George. He said, what's Marshall's first name, somebody? John? Hmm? <laughs> anyway, General Marshall. Well, I'm just saying General Marshall. <laughs> And it shows her shaking hands with him and all these other men behind there, Adelaide Stevenson, you can see. Uh, she, she'd shown her stuff, and she had stood up for what she thought was right. Uh, <coughs> there's a picture of the, the back channel group uh, in the White House, Truman, Marshall, and two other gentlemen we didn't get to identify. When um, Truman came out for his first um, press conference on the evening of FDR's um, death in April uh, 1945, the first question asked to him was, 
Are you going to support the United Nations? Because they didn't think Truman was the type that he was kind of a nationalist and didn't know much about the world. And his answer right away, strong and clear, was yes. And so that provided continuity because they were in two months there was going to be the first conference to kind of have its, uh, at that time, 51 uh, nation states come and hammer out the charter provisions. And then when the signing ceremony uh, happened on October 25th, Truman rode the train out and gave a fantastic speech, certainly one of globalism, um, and that was way beyond what people's perception of him was. Um, now we have a series of photos, which I wish you could see. <clears throat> a picture, George. A picture of George Marshall on the cover of Time Magazine, Man of the Year. And then we look briefly at two secretary generals in the United Nations who have been world leaders and have gone beyond uh, where they thought um, they were, so to speak. Um, the United States had forced out the Secretary General, this is in the 90s, 95, uh, 96, um, an Egyptian gentleman um, who the United States kind of found too erratic or whatever. So he had to resign and they had to pick, just pick, in a regular election, um, and a su successor. And there were four candidates that kind of um, showed up. One was, um, one was the, uh, the Russians vetoed, another one the United States vetoed, another one didn't seem to attract attention, and finally said, well, what about this Dag Hammarskjöld? He, he, he's okay. And the United States agreed because, well, he won't cause any trouble. <laughs> and they were quite wrong. Um, <laughs> a picture of him meeting with Ralph Bunch, um, who was part of the United Nations uh, in its early years. Um, and uh, Dominic Harmasol had um, one credential that nobody knows much about. Yes, he set up, P uh, he, he expanded the use of the Peace Corps, and this time it was in, the last time was in uh, Congo, where he unfortunately died in a plane crash, which was suspicious. But before he got into UN work and financial work in Sweden, he was a literature major in his uh, education, and he, um, but he had a vision, which he wrote his honors paper on, on it's called The Rise of Business, uh, and what must be pretty boring. He had a vision that after the war, there was going to emerge a world economy. No more just bilateral arrangements, um, but there was going to be a real world economy and this new United Nations needed to work to support that world economy. And, and that, it's come true in many ways when we start having corporations, you know, making some car parts here and some there, and we have different um, trade groups. Um, so he was, that, that vision was needed. Um, then we have the Secretary General Kofi Annan, who um, was uh, from, obviously, Africa, very well educated, and he was chosen to succeed um, the Egyptian gentleman and he, at that time, the, the United Nations was very, very um, uh, um, depressed, broke, no much support. They'd failed to do anything for the Bosnia problem or the Sarajevo problem. And so he kind of was sitting around bored and wondering, well, what can I do? And he realized that a United Nations, just based on the activity of delegates, was not going to be broad enough. And he said, who's missing? Businessmen. So he called up somebody who knew and said, can we have breakfast? And so a group of businessmen, corporate leaders, met. And he said, you need to get involved with this institution. 
you need to be giving support. You're going to be better off if there's a strong United Nations that can keep the peace and all that. And they did buy into it. Um, and he also saw, uh, by this time, everybody was wondering, what are these NGOs, non-governmental organizations? And there seemed to be a lot of them and a lot of people involved and in doing um, uh, some good things. And they have experience uh, with, the, with the world and with trying to get into concrete situations and help people. And he, um, so he contacted someone he knew that was a leader of one of the NGO's associations and reached out to them and started having meetings with these two new groups and, and said, well, what should the United Nations do? And the idea came up, now we're into 2001, uh, that um, why don't we set some goals? And they ended up setting the so-called Millennium Goals. There were 10 of them. And they were approved by the General Assembly in 2002. And they were to be fulfilled by 2015. So you may remember hearing about them and say, well, we're 30% uh, on that, trying to bring better health care to um, women. Um, oh, but we're, we've done marvelously in re providing um, better agriculture sources. And so that went, um, um, that went well. And so the UN began to pick up steam and they had all more people. And it's a very active place now. You can go on and even watch committee meetings. Um, uh, you have, uh, and also the issue of hiring more people from around the globe. They shouldn't all be Europeans and Americans. And making people pay their dues. Um, I think it was George Bush, it was either Clinton or George Bush, that finally stopped the boycott of payment that had been going on for years because the UN was uh, supporting this thing that was too socialist or whatever it was, or it's too blo bureaucracy is bloated. And so they began to get cooperation from really thousands of people, if not millions. And if you, you know, go online, you can learn all kinds of things from the United Nations. So in that way, he certainly uh, engaged in world leadership, and he was there for two terms. He's now passed away, but um, another, another woman, um, another uh, agency uh, activist in the United Nations, um, and they have pronunciation guides on the website for this name, Umila Milambo Nakuka. She's South African. She started kind of trying to help the women, the children. She got herself, she was appointed to the highest appointment in South Africa uh, the, um, uh, as deputy prime minister when the successor to Nelson Mandela took office for three years. He was a good guy and he hired a good term at, uh, team. But there was another guy who was, uh, you could just feel his corruption, but he did everything he could to attack this and got a huge group of uh, people yelling for his, him to become president. And he did, um, so she lost her job. But so she had been in parliament and deputy prime minister. So she went back to developing international um, NGOs that focused on education for children, bringing them into with uh, bringing them up to technologically competent um, um, people, and she kept she saw that education wasn't going to be successful if there wasn't poverty a remedy for poverty and for health care. So she's um, just kind of supported and there flourished a number of NGOs under her influence. And then uh, it was Kofi Annan who noticed that, uh, hey, she should be in the United Nations. So she was given a job at the United Nations um, and there she could, um, and, and you said represented in her are all the influence I spoke of, political, um, uh, NGO, volunteer organizations, and the institution of the United Nations. And so she served in various positions 
Uh, and then was given the one of UN Women. If you look her up, uh, you can see, and she's done all kinds of support activities. And just last week, she was the leading organizer of a conference in Paris uh, that was leading to kind of generate enthusiasm for more effort on this goal of education with technology, uh, reducing poverty and bringing health care, sanitation conditions. So if you've never heard of her, but there are so many like her out there. And then I put in, now we're going to look at a few other individuals, and then we'll move on to Teddy Roosevelt. Um, I put in Eisenhower, who of course was very busy in World War II and as president, um, and because he did something singular, a single act of global leadership, which was part of the transformation from the old system of imperialism to the new system of national independence. In 1956, the governments of Israel, France, and Great Britain secretly planned an invasion of Egypt and a takeover, and cross over the Suez Canal, and a takeover of the Suez Canal management facility. And they did not include the Americans because Americans would raise a lot of questions and delay things. Uh, but they assumed the Americans would come along with their, with their operation. And their rationale was that, uh, that t these people, um, they were, you know, they wouldn't know how to run such an important installation. And Eisenhower was furious. And he absolutely, and he recognized that it was a, the trend was towards national independence and learning to trust that human beings in other countries, non-European countries, had the intelligence and the interest in making things work. So uh, they were mad because Abdul Gamal Nasser, uh, who had recently been revealed as the real leader of the 1952 revolution, revolution uh, was going to suck up to Russia and let the Russians take over. Well, he was furious, and he gave an immediate order, withdraw, and there would be, or there will be consequences. And they were, the conspirators were shocked. The Prime Minister of England lost his job almost immediately because the press reaction, the public reaction um, was so strong. You just want to go back to imperialism. Give it up. We're now in a new stage of uh, world governance. So he was, um, that I think he deserves some credit for. He just stood against um, uh, what was a backward, you might say, motion. And so that, um, it took a while, they, they got, they left the canal area very quickly. It took a couple of decades for Israel to give up the Sinai Desert. Um, another world leader, Bono. Now, Russ knows more about Bono than I do, but here's a photo of him with his arms around an African child um, giving, um, giving hope and encouragement, and there are other African children there. And here's, he's, uh, he's just been a marvelous and uh, creator, and when his, um, his friends who were with him in various bands and musical um, entities said, what are you doing with that? And he said, no, and this is why. And he actually persuaded some of them to join the effort. So kind of, you don't have to be an educated diplomat to be um, out there being very diplomatic in the world. Uh, a picture of Matthew Ricard, uh, big smile on his face, be kind with animals, don't eat them. Yeah. And, <laughs> and he, um, he's known for his book on altruism because he, looking it all over, he's a top of the line scientist in the French system. And he began to question the inadequacy of Western science and, and he explored uh, Buddhism and Eastern thought and he realized he had to transform himself to become an athletic human being, which he did. He learned uh, Buddhism, he became a monk and he's now living in a monastery uh, up there in the mountains. Um, but his contribution was to support the research that the Dalai Lama wanted uh, 
scientifically to measure the brain reactions of people, of monks to meditation and to prove to people, well, here's the scientific evidence that something's happening. Um, and now how many laboratories around the world are, are scientists kind of quietly doing the same kind of experiments? Um, so that was um, uh, a global contribution. And also to say that human beings are altruistic by nature um, this is to challenge the, um, the viewpoint of Thomas Hobbes and later of Charles Darwin that basically we're kind of selfish, self-preservative um, uh, individuals who <coughs> whose first priority is to um, protect ourselves and our uh, possessions. And so he's uh, given the world a much broad, a bigger thought to, to uh, think about. Vedana Shiva, uh, her seed idea um, just has flourished and it's very well recognized and farmers come to her for advice and there are experiments all over the world to avoid the, uh, having to grow genetic modified foods by um, trying to gain uh, seeds that are natural, the natural product of each harvest cycle. And she's been here to the Institute. We had a program over in Faulkner Gallery. She's a very personal person, tough-minded though. She started her world career by these incredible indictments of world corporations that were on C-SPAN. But uh, she certainly has gained respect and influence um, and really on her own. I mean, now she gets uh, private donations, but she's been out there fighting for what she thinks is right. Pete Seeger, uh, the musician, why can't a global leader be a, uh, someone who influences um, um, people that way? A photo of him uh, at a huge rally where people were learning to sing the songs and sing together, and that uh, you can call a kind of global leadership. Yo-Yo Ma, who's gone way beyond just playing at concerts, um, he finds all kinds of ways uh, to help people. He particularly wants to provide education for children in the violin who wouldn't have the home situation to, um, to learn something like this or to buy a violin. Um, one of his latest contributions during the pandemic, uh, near his home in Massachusetts, he, has, he, would, he went over to a... Um, uh, a vaccine site, and he would sit there outside the door um, playing music while people waited to go in, and then when they were coming out with, for their 15 minute wait. So he just wanted to make it a little lighter and uh, reduce their stress. And then finally there's Greta, um, Greta Thunberg. And certainly <laughs> she has created a worldwide movement. It shows a picture of her with her um, with holding a sign outside the Swedish parliament. Uh, she started going every fi Friday, 15 years old. Her parents were not too for it, but it seemed like a harmless thing for a 15 year old. So a sign says in Swedish, but what it says in English is school strike for climate. And um, that just in that simple act um, at first, uh, her friends thought she was a little kooky, but um, it attracted more attention and she found allies in other cities who were, again, young people who really believed that we had to do something. Uh, she's very famous for her speech at the United Nations where she kind of shouted several times, how dare you, you know, ignore climate cha uh, change uh, needs. Um, Within a year, she had uh, sponsored and, and uh, actually found people to organize protests in several different cities, and the total was over a million people. Well, how many people can create a movement of a million people in one year? Okay, so I think we'll put her on the list, right? <laughs> okay, there's a photo of her speaking through a microphone. She got the attention of the world and there's something called the Greta effect, where people, including politicians, come in to say, 
who were influenced by her and said, you're right, you know, our generation has just ignored this climate change problem. And so testimonials abide of how Greta, Greta influenced me and made me kind of get active. Uh, she took a year off to go back to finish her education. And so that's been, um, but she, um, and she's now continuing at the university. And she was very disappointed by the conference last uh, June and May where among other things, the tr Trump administration sent delegates to de deliberately block, disrupt what the convention was trying to do. So it never passed any resolutions like earlier ones had. And she's worked through uh, for these UN conferences on climate uh, issues that have come up in 2018, 2019. Uh, 2020, there was obviously uh, pandemic blocks, but there's going to be a conference in November. So we'll see how she and the Biden administration uh, get along and maybe accomplish something. What will that be? Um, I knew, but I just, is it Paris? No, I think it might, you know, it's just slipped my mind, but it's in Europe, um, I think Vienna. So what's characteristic of global leadership? I think I'm not gonna make my promise to Maurice, but he can go ahead and leave and somebody else can do what he was going to do. <laughs> what characteristics of global leadership have we seen? Well, qualities that excite, respect, courage, empathy, sincerity, that responds to growing needs with possible solutions and alternative paths, that instantiate principles, show moral requirements and a path to fulfillment of them. Leaders, such leaders articulate human rights and call for universal responsibility. They influence others to try what leaders represent. They show the sacrifice of individual well-being to become involved in world leadership. While acting locally, they offer universal values and practices. In South Africa, for instance, the process of reconciliation uh, led by Bishop Tutu, among others, that now has been duplicated in many <coughs> uh, uh, such kind of conflict situations. Um, the, uh, another is the United States Civil Rights Movement and the development of nonviolent protests. They have shown the capacity to use modern media and which creates a global community with, for whatever their cause is. They provide linkage to institutions and help shape global agendas of those institutions. And they, um, and, and you might know of a, a organization here in Santa Barbara that's put climate change on their agenda of concern. And they've created a larger community of global leaders. Um, so now if you, you know, you can just find many more if you want to be creative in your use of the internet. Well, now what about global leadership American style? And here we have um, the, um, the, action of, the actions of Theodore Roosevelt. Um, I think we got a little delayed at the beginning, so we're gonna be a little bit delayed here. But Maurice, you can go ahead. We'll find somebody to do your job. Um, the, Theodore Roosevelt, uh, born October 27th, 1858. Location New York was at the height of national influence, a vibrant city, and his family was a uh, very high status in it. They were wealthy. Uh, there was kind of a Roosevelt tribe. If you've always been wondering what's the relationship between TR and FDR, um, a TR's brother married and fathered Eleanor Roosevelt. So TR was, uh, Frank, TR was her uncle. And his sixth cousin fathered Franklin Delano Roosevelt. So you really got two Roosevelts marrying each other, but you know, appropriately. <laughs> um, his, father, his father was an ideal, um, an ideal uh, he, uh, father, he thought, and a companion. 
He died when PR was 22 years old, uh, but he, um, he described his father this way. Um, he combined strength and courage with gentleness, tenderness, and great unselfishness. He would not tolerate in us children selfishness or cruelty, idleness, cowardice, or untruthfulness. Um, and he would take them all on trips to Europe and shape their cosmopolitan perspective. Uh, while hiking with his father in his Alps, he, in the Alps he learned the need for exercise, which um, eventually cured the asthma that had uh, been so strong when he was a young man. Uh, he also, on a, on a um, camping trip, uh, was manhandled by, um, um, by two older boys, uh, bullied, manhandled, and what do you think his response to it was? He went and found a boxing coach to teach him how to fight <laughs> and strengthen his body. Uh, as a six-year-old, he witnessed the funeral procession of Abraham Lincoln <coughs> down Fifth African, uh, um, Avenue. And he was homeschooled, took an early interest in zoology of all sorts. He announced at seven that he was going to be a scientist, and he and his brother set up the Roosevelt Natural History Museum. By age nine, he had publicized the natural history of insects. Uh, he finally went to Harvard. He majored in uh, natural science, but uh, took a lot of literature. Uh, he's a great lover of poetry, and he, of course, is a huge writer. He wrote many books, um, and he read, it's, it's estimated he read 10,000 books. Um, he had a little critique of Harvard education as being too rigid and not creative. His first book, The Naval War of 1812, is still a classic. He went to Columbia Law School, but dropped out and decided he wanted to go into politics. He was elected three terms to the New York State Assembly, but then experienced a personal tragedy. Uh, his life was not all golden. His much-loved mother and first wife died on the same day, February 24th, 1884. So that was a shock that he never really got over, but he carried on. Uh, and then there's some photos of him and his youth and at a Harvard picture, and one that shows a tremendous clarity and intensity in his eyes. Um, kind of, he dropped out of the assembly, or he finished the term, didn't run again, decided he needed to uh, kind of get away from it all. And so he started going out to uh, North Dakota, and he bought a ranch there, and he lived there, um, and eventually a bigger ranch. He relished the freedom, the lifestyle. He learned to ride horses, camp out, shoot bison, uh, and earned the respect after initial disdain of the other ranchers. And so this is all a preparation, you can see, for leadership. His physical strength was developed. His asthma was cured. Committed to the strenuous life, as he put it, when he was back in uh, the Washington and New York area. And that uh, he engaged in boxing, tennis, hiking, rowing, polio, and horseback riding. And then took, when he was president, judizo training. But the women who uh, were his supporters and the women's organizations were very strong at that time, they said, hey, we want that kind of training and demanded that he find an instructor for these women, and he asked his Japanese uh, jiu-jitsu master to do so, and they did. And it, uh, so they, the women started to get training, and it in very much said to improve their, um, their strength, their, whatever, their um, sense of empowerment. Uh, there's a photo here of him as a cowboy holding his musket. Yeah, he loved the West, and that is really uh, something to think about, that he could transform himself, um, both in attitude and in uh, actual practice. Um, he became, um, during even before he was president, uh, he, the fam famous meeting with John Muir, and the idea uh, that Muir transmitted of there being a forest 
mountains areas be preserved. Um, and that he certainly supported and helped create, I think it was about seven national parks. Before that though, he was a lover of birds, real, knew all about them, went on bird watching trips. He, uh, uh, he uh, said to, um, he, he created the first park or refuge for birds. He did it by executive authority, they were called so uh, he didn't need Congress's approval at that time, and they quickly expanded around the country. <clears throat> the one he created was in uh, in, uh, in Florida, and um, you know a lot of the politicians thought that was kind of kooky, but um, he thought birds should be protected, as should all forms of life, except in the fair. Um, you could say it's a contradiction. You could say that. Uh, uh, later when he went on an African safari under the Smithsonian and the Natural History Museum of New York, um, they had scientists there and a doctor there and uh, this is East Africa um, and went through what, not yet what was Kenya, but that whole area. He met people and they ended up in Egypt. But they did kill a lot of animals. I think eight elephants was part of that. They shipped, most of them were smaller animals, but they shipped eight animals back uh, to have in the museums. And when challenged, he said, yes, I did kill these animals, but look what I did for the American people. He thought it was really important that the American people learn about the animals uh, as well as the fauna. Um, of the um, uh, of the world, and of course we know today that taking a small child to a natural history museum is a, an exciting experience, and so you can make up your own mind about that. Um, he got back into politics, and we're not going to. And one part of it was domestic policy, and we're not going to talk about this um, because it's not the time. But you can see that he met Jane Addams and others during when he came back in the second half of the 1990s um, and was very touched by her progressive ideals. So he was ready when he did become president in September 2001 because, not because he was elected, but by a fluke that President McKinley, who, with whom he was good friends, and who had accepted him as vice president um, uh, trusted him and it was, um, so he had a little bit he could do as vice president, but as president, he just went at it. The first term, uh, 2001 to 2019, 19, okay, 19, excuse me, <laughs> talking too fast. Um, he wanted to break down the trusts and insist on their regulation enforce regulation of railroads that hadn't uh, been the law of uh, creating the international, uh, the Interstate Commerce Commission had not been enforced. He was willing to work with unions. There's a famous intervention I'll come back to in a minute. He believed in welfare legislation. I'm just highlighting a few of the things he did. The Pure Food and Drug Act, which um, involves inspections and both of factories and you know, what food in the store, and the Meat Inspection Act, where you couldn't put it in a market if you didn't have a little sticker, and some of you may be old enough to remember the little red stickers on packages of meat in your grocery store. About 20 years, it was, the, it was announced that they no longer needed to do that because their methods of packaging meat were uh, up to snuff. Whether that's true or not, it's up to you. Um, the famous intervention uh, with, uh, there was a coal strike in, I think it was 2002, um, it's not, not remembering the date on that. 1902. 1902. Um, he, um, he's my assistant, <laughs> very valuable assistant. Um, and the, it was dragging on, um, the workers wanted sh more pay and shorter hours. The operators, the owners of the coal factories, in this case it was uh, one in West Virginia, absolutely refused. 
It was dragging on, winter was coming. Um, he was worried there'd be a shortage, particularly in New England, and people would just be, you know, really in a bad situation. So he overcame his resistance to having the government get involved in uh, the, uh, in, you know, union management uh, relationships, he invited the head of the union, a man named Minchel, and the head of the mine to come down to the White House and meet there. And both kind of resist, well, the, the union man was delighted. We got an invitation to the White House? That's certainly a change. Um, the owners resisted and resisted, and it's a long, complicated story, but eventually, he got them both to come to a meeting. There was 12 people there, and um, they didn't make any agreement. Uh, they say that the, the union rep uh, behaved with great dignity, and the mine owner, when they were uh, shouting and you know, just generally, you know, come on, <laughs> let's sit down and behave. Um, and it dragged out, actually, for a year. Uh, finally, um, he got them to, um, the issue became with the unions go back to work uh, with uh, some promise of a new situation. Roosevelt appointed a commission, it worked, there was representation, and finally uh, arbitration was accepted. And so finally, um, really a year after they got an agreement, and that is the first agreement that the federal government, you know, the president actually managed, pressured, did everything. Um, he believed in something called the fair deal. And that meant that he wasn't against capitalism, but there had to be a fair deal. The situation was very much like today of a, um, of a, um, um, of a, uh, small group of very wealthy men and making uh, money on the stock market and uh, profits, not sharing them with anybody. He, did, he just wanted a fair deal. Everybody, every human being, and that carried over to his foreign policy, every human being deserved a fair deal. And he used the bully pulpit, and we have a photo of him uh, up there addressing a crowd and, you know, he was always trying to teach them and to get them excited about supporting change. And he did become very popular during his presidency, and that became a new reality that um, um, the old codgers in the Senate, and the same problem, uh, they could get uh, things through the House, but in the Senate there were just enough um, resistors to everything. And, you know, well, what's the president doing trying to solve a labor strike and every issue uh, they were against. So he began issuing executive orders more than all the ones that had been um, made by the previous presidents. And the only ones who have outdone him is number of over a thousand is FDR and Trump. <laughs> Um, here's a picture of him with a globe uh, ready to, to be part of the world. And um, to give, a, is this, are you willing to still listen? Um, yes? Sure. <laughs> um, what do we want to focus on his foreign policy activism. We spoke of, you know, he had a cosmopolitan perspective early in life. He did get appointed Assistant Secretary of the Navy in the first term of McKinley, and he is very influenced by a book called The Influence of Sea Power Upon History by Alfred Thayer McMahon, and published in 1890, in which the strategy for a country is to build battleships, dominate the oceans, exercise diplomacy, and just uh, be coercive when you're defending borders. And so he got busy building battleships, and we'll hear more about that later. But they became very useful in the Cuban War, where he resigned from his office and went out to train, raise and train of volunteer militias and became to be known as the Rough Riders. And that was what 
the Revolutionary War in 1776 was fought by. So he thought that was a very American thing to do, and there were several others. Um, his just and we've got to go down and into Cuba that was being controlled by Spain, controlled's the wrong word. Spain was quite poor, it couldn't afford a colony. Uh, it was a colony that went back 400 years. So it was kind of time for change. Uh, his justification for intervention was humanitarian. The Cuban people, everyone saw that, were starving. It was just not enough food. And a practical interest in having um, an island that's so close, what, 90 miles apart, um, uh, be under control of, uh, either be independent or be within the American family. Spain didn't belong there. And while he was Secretary of State before he resigned, um, Roosevelt sent some of his battleships to the Philippines under the command of Admiral Dewey and said, you know, be on guard, I mean, be ready. And so when it, um, the war began to break, break out, he gave an order his uh, boss was a very sickly man, and, and he just turned over everything to Roosevelt. And typically, he took the initiative when he saw it. And so at the key moment, he ordered Dewey to go into the harbor of Manila and take, um, take control, and that was kind of a, that led to more complexities. Uh, but his justification, for intervention, humanitarian practical interest. The second one, which uh, you might laugh at, is to give Americans something to think about other than material gain. Uh, after they, the militia was very successful, um, two major battles that they fought, they did experience casualties. After that, he asked to send them home, and he went home. During the whole war, there's huge media publicity, which you probably read about in your history book, full of jingoism and Americanism. Um, the Pulsaro dynasty and the Hearst dynasty competed for readers. And the net effect of entrance into the war was 50-50 at the beginning. That by the time it was over, um, the supporters had raised itself. He, um, Americans won, they took over a kind of um, a t uh, soft uh, c uh, control. But in uh, 1902, uh, after he'd become president, he arranged for their independence. The situation in the um, Philippines was more complicated because there was resistance by people saying they wanted an independent republic right away. And Roosevelt rethought the whole notion of intervention. And he saw that it did not work for a foreign country to go into a country. It was kind of the lesson learned in, in Vietnam. Um, no, taking over another country, that wasn't really feasible. Countries had changed since the time the Dutch went into um, uh, Indonesia uh, way back when and could easily uh, take control of the country. So that was part of his, um, there's a picture here of him with his men, the Rough Riders. Uh, they uh, were treated well, say the historians. Initially, Roosevelt had a lot of critics, the liberals, um, that he was you know, too warlike and intervention. Um, and that kind of lasted, a kind of a negative reputation, which is why you haven't heard of him lasted through the 20th century, but 21st century historians have gone back, looked at the facts, and come out with quite different conclusions. So um, one conclusion is that he treated his men well, and, was, um, and once they went back, they became champions of him uh, for a long time to come. Here's him on a horse. Uh, after getting off the train, um, getting into, um, uh, Havana, um, what did he do? He rode a horse, what he learned in his cowboy experience. Um, so now he's president, and what is he going to do? We're almost to the end of this. Uh, he's foreign, he becomes president uh, by accident. 
um, a really weird thing because he was given the, the, the uh, vice presidency with the encouragement of uh, activists in New York, well, get him out of New York where he's trying to do all this reform. He'll be useless as vice president, as that's the typical um, view. Um, but no one expected him to become president. He thought you had to uphold the balance of power. So, you know, you had to kind of respond to Germany and Britain and France or doing all these uh, activities to expand still their imperialism. Uh, but you had to balance the power but expand American influence. He, interestingly, he supported an open door policy to China. No outside power should have uh, a dominance in China. He wanted to uphold the Monroe Doctrine, but later ad added a corollary to it. And, and he, he did remove the last uh, European power. Um, but then a crisis early on in his presidency rose where Germany and Great Britain had, um, had difficulty collecting loans debts that they had given to the Venezuelan government. So they sailed their navies over there and threatened intervention at least long enough to get their money back somehow. Uh, when Roosevelt, when he heard this, um, he sent his own navy down to Venezuela and he threatened to destroy the German Navy uh, if they dared to get off their boats. And Germany, uh, he would appoint a commission and, or, and hold a conference that could debate it. Um, so he averted the uh, intervention and announced this, though, as a compromise to Roosevelt Corley, which said, they would, uh, American forces would intervene, or the American government would intervene, only if um, it was necessary to take control of the Roosevelt, uh, of the Venezuelan um, debt. And he promised uh, Britain and Germany, because he was so afraid of Germany just trying to take the permanent control, uh, he promised that they would pay for the, pay the debts if necessary. And so that was, to protect financial resources was a legitimate intervention. He established a special relationship with Great Britain, a phrase you've heard about, and was enthusiastically endorsed by several countries. He finally gave independence for Cuba, but not for Puerto Rico, because Puerto Rico he saw as a, a, a gateway protection to the new Panama Canal. Um, the Venezuela, the Moroccan crisis, Britain uh, was given kind of permission to go in and take some active role. The Sultan there was a bit weak. Um, Germany got wind of it and said, no, they were gonna go take control. France was thinking of it. So he organized a conference and um, he was just so committed to this idea, sit down and talk to each other. And he didn't like arbitration because it was too rigid. He liked the flexibility of dialogue. And so he, that became known and more and more countries began to say, hey, if we've got a problem, a conflict with another government, let's call the Americans and have them come engage in diplomacy. And that became very, why it's so strong in the United Nations Charter. And so that worked and they, uh, the Sultan kept his job, um, but Morocco would be open to all, any power that wanted to come in to do business could do so. Now the big accomplishment was to find a way out of the Russo-Japanese War, and there was a map here that you could see. Uh, that broke out in 1905, and um, it was a real war, um, and Japan, uh, Russia wanted to expand clearly uh, its control to the Pacific Ocean. Japan wanted to have some influence in Manchuria and wanted to gain control of Korea, which is actually closer <coughs> to it than to Japan than I realized. The Japanese managed to destroy the entire Russian Navy, but the Russians, uh, 
uh, we were very successful in land battles. Japanese, the Japanese didn't really didn't have enough people. Dragging on, Roosevelt, through back channels, offered to negotiate a solution. At first, both sides refused. More, more weakness. The main weakness for Japan, they didn't have the economic resources to keep a war going. The main problem for the Russian government is it was very unpopular. People, why are we out there spending money fighting a war? Why aren't you back here doing, you know, what's needed to be done uh, for the, <clears throat> the Russian people? And that proved um, very, uh, that, that became an issue that led to the Russian Revolution of 1917. So Roosevelt finally got both sides to agree. He invited them to New Hampshire, where they stayed, and every day were uh, taken, this is August of 2000, um, excuse me, <laughs> nine and, um, I think it was um, nine. No, it was, on, it was earlier than that, I think it was seven. I'm sorry, I have all these dates written down, but. Um, so they came to America and um, were treated to a conference for three weeks it took, and they had to all sit down at a table. You've got pictures of them sitting down at the table, talking it over, each side having main issues. Japan want reparations. Um, the um, um, the um, Russians wanted you know, the land grab. Um, but they, he, um, they agreed and signed what's called the Treaty of Portsmouth. And you can easily see that on the internet. Um, Japan did get control of, um, of Korea, which all this leads on to 30 years of peace before it all broke down in the 1930s. So he was a big hero and he got the Nobel Peace Prize um, in 1910 for having accomplished this. And th this was part of a big deal. People were shocked that an Asian power could make war on a European power. And they were also shocked that um, uh, the Russians could do reasonably well. Um, so they, um, they, but the Japanese did not get um, uh, land, significant land in Russia. They did get Korea. They didn't get reparations. So that became, he became known all over the world for the victory of diplomacy. His role was all back channel. He was right there, he'd hear in the evening, well, they're not, they're stuck on this. And he would say, well, try this. So he was uh, very involved and he was smart enough to be able to absorb facts and creative enough to come up with um, st uh, compromises. And if that didn't work, come up with another compromise. So that really is uh, one of the, um, the major accomplishments of his foreign policy. You want to see the map. The last thing was the Panama Canal, which was too, it's too complicated to describe how uh, he ended up favoring the route through Panama rather than the route through Colombia. And um, there was, uh, the only way he could get approval of that um, from the, Columbia refused to let the canal be bought, uh, built, but there was a new group in Panama that successfully led to the establishment of a government, and they said, come on in, come on in. And so the Panama Canal was built, um, terribly challenging, malaria was a problem, and um, uh, so you, the photos you're not seeing. The last thing in this presidency, was the desire to really show off American power. So he designated 16 battleships. He painted them white all on this hull. He put in, um, and, and up front there was the American flag was painted and there were some gold knobs at the very bow. And he and announced it all. They sailed from uh, Hampton, Virginia in December of 2007, I mean 1907, <laughs> kind of stuck there. 
And so here's a photo of them. You can find it on the internet. It was very impressive. He made a speech. The crowds were there cheering. And his, his goal was to just symbolize um, American um, power, that we, nobody else could match our naval power, even though these particular battleships were kind of out of date. They had been built before the Cuban War. And the new, more safe and stronger battleship was being constructed, which called the Dreadnoughts. Um, so they had a better way in which the cannon could be placed, among other things. They sailed all around the world. Um, they went up to San Francisco and the sail and big parties and greetings and all of that. Um, went to Asia, went to Sri Lanka, then went to the Suez Canal, um, and finally back home, uh, got there February 1909. Um, a month before his term ended, um, again, people still cheering, and it worked. It was a great symbol, uh, these uh, white battleships, uh, other than that. And I think, this looks kind of final picture of him. Now, I guess we should go ahead, Robert, but if you need to leave, um, we wanted no, to... we can't play it. What? We can't play it? Oh, dear. Well, we'll, uh, we were planning to um, um, give you 10 minutes of President Obama and his speech to the Muslim world that he made in Cairo in his, uh, now we are into the 20s, <laughs> um, uh, the f June of his first year of the presidency. And he gives a fantastic speech for an hour. Uh, they listen, they applaud. And the last 10 minutes gives the vision of global leadership and what we, but not in the way people sometimes expect of setting up something arbitrary because he's really calling for all of us to participate in global leadership and the support of global leaders. Um, so you can go online and see that maybe sometime there'll be a way to uh, share that speech. So um, TR went on to live, I got out of office in 1909, and he died um, uh, in 1919. So he went through World War I, which, uh, in which the old order collapsed. We, we don't realize that three, um, really four empires collapsed during World War I. And he was, uh, he couldn't, he thought Wilson was weak. He delayed entry, he, uh, which cost many thousands of lives in the trench warfare of Europe. Um, but he came out with a vision, um, not only of world power, um, he said war may be necessary. He had five points of foreign policy and war was there but only if really necessary. All his other um, points or goals in foreign policy had to do with diplomacy, with um, keeping in mind the needs of the people um, as, and um, allowing for uh, promoting democracy. So he, um, he, made, he became a committed progressive um, by the time, uh, 19, 19, no, 2018, he was convinced, um, no, we're still in 19, <laughs> sorry, 1919, uh, 1918, his last major speech, he hurt his legs in a trip around the Brazilian rivers, and um, they were a, um, um, they were a problem for the rest of his and he got malaria, the problem for the rest of his life. But in his last major speech, he offered a full progressive agenda, unemployment compensation, um, healthcare insurance. Um, he had six or seven major things that are exactly, they're identical to what FDR was promoting in uh, 1936. So he was, um, in a way, he, he had the vision, he just didn't have 
the Congress um, and the time. He had promised he wouldn't serve after I served or well, be a second term officially. And he insisted on Taft being um, his successor, and that was a major mistake he made. He's a much more qualified gentleman to carry on his uh, legacy than Taft turned out to be. Um, but um, there's so much in his activity and his energy <coughs> that energized other people. Uh, <coughs> we should mention he's the, uh, the source of the teddy bear. There's different stories about how a small bear that had lost its mother became <coughs> protected by him and, uh, and then uh, there was a merchant who had the idea of making teddy bears and now everybody has a teddy bear. So <laughs> I guess that's world leadership too. But um, we'll stop there. But I hope you can see that yes, there's a president, there's a political person who did in fact, um, um, who did in fact uh, uh, support um, changes in the way American foreign policy was perceived. Um, but um, it took, the, and really you find so much that happened later, including, uh, he, oh, he did also recommend, I think we mentioned this, uh, a create uh, an institution, a, a, a united um, for peace. And um, that vision came true. So we can hear about him, but don't remember, but don't forget all the other people who aren't politicians, who aren't in government, who have developed and practiced global leadership. Wow, thank you very, very much. Just on behalf of the Institute, I just wanted to offer a vote of uh, thanks. Maurice had to go to another engagement. And um, thank you so much for being such a great history teacher, you really made the case that there is such thing as global, global leadership. leadership. That's, what, that's what I hoped uh, I would. <laughs> I wasn't quite so sure about that at the beginning, but yeah. uh, I'm very convinced now. So, and you started off with the DNA, the spiritual DNA of mm -hmm. the Dalai Lama and Gandhi and so forth, but then you made a thread throughout all these examples and exemplars, all the way to rock stars and folk singers and so forth, Greta, Thunberg, et cetera. But um, you talked about the transformation of all these individuals and then how transformative they were. And to me, that there must be a profound connection between those two, two things, is the personal transformation and how transformative they were. And one other thing that occurred to me is that it's interesting on the founding day address that it's, it's July 4th, et cetera, which has to do with independence, but also interdependence. And uh, these global leaders were um, exemplars of both, weren't they? Uh, they were yeah. independent of um, the current thought. They had something new to offer. And yet, they were visionaries of interdependence. So thank you very much, Carolyn, on behalf of the Institute of World Culture. This was a wonderful and inspiring um, founding day address. And if you use the internet, um, go on um, line um, to YouTube, follow the instructions given in the newsletter and on the website, and then you can see all the photos you missed. But actually, oh. Carolyn pioneered a new technology. Did you notice that? You notice how a picture uh, tells a thousand words, right? In about 10 words per slide, she's able to <laughs> <laughs> get us to kind of see the pictures. So, pretty remarkable. Yeah, and really, really, yeah. should we mention anything about the, uh, I saw in the website, save the date for a... Um, the talk on the symbolism of the lotus. Yes. On the 17th, I believe it is. So that's our next program. So. We'll have the projector working. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, At that time. We thank you very much for your patience with our technology.